our keynote today uh, is, has actually been a, a very key advisor to me over the years. Uh, when I first started Americans for Safe Access, um, I actually had, had worked in politics before, had never worked in cannabis policy. Um, I actually I did a lot of work in global justice issues. And when I learned that medical cannabis had 80% support nationwide, I said, oh, this is going to be easy. <laughs> We're going to be able to do this in a couple years. Um, but what I, what I quickly learned was that uh, medical cannabis isn't just an issue about prohibition, that it's also um, what's been just as important is that if we wanted to create a space for cannabis as a medicine, there was a lot more that we had to do than just um, change uh, criminal exemptions uh, for arrests, that we actually had to uh, walk in the steps of medicine, that we had to put forward information for doctors that they could understand, uh, that we had to, to work on creating uh, GMP standards uh, for cannabis and, and really you know, put cannabis in its world of, uh, of an herbal medicine. And one person in particular um, was my advisor on how to do that. And I can't tell you how many very patient phone calls um, Ethan had with me over the years explaining what the next step was that we needed to do. And when I found out that um, Ethan's uh, professional life was changing, uh, the first thing I, I, I did was I sent him a text that said, great, I hear you're going to be the keynote at my conference this year. <laughs> So it is with, with great, great honor to introduce um, really a, a major thought leader in medical cannabis, um, the, uh, again, my, my advisor, uh, major advisor, and really a friend uh, to this movement, Dr. Ethan Rousseau. So. Well, thanks, Steph, for that gracious introduction. I'm going to need to talk fast, because half an hour is not enough for my favorite topic. Um, but to talk about cannabis and some of the controversies, first we have to introduce the endocannabinoid system. And uh, certainly, uh, this is reaching the cognizance of people in the movement. Alice, thanks for your introduction. Um, but it really has not filtered down to the general public or to the medical community. But this is an internal system that is involved in homeostasis of almost every physiological process. It has three components, the receptors, CB1 and CB2, their uh, biosynthetic and degradative enzymes, and uh, the uh, endocannabinoids themselves, anandamide, and 2-AG. Um, there are active and inactive components that work in concert in the concept uh, that Dr. Michelin presented called the entourage effect. Um, there are cannabinoid receptors throughout the body. We think of CB1, the primary psychoactive uh, receptor, as being part of the central nervous system, but it's in the periphery as well. Uh, additionally, you have CB2, which is thought of mainly, mainly as an immunomodulatory receptor, uh, mainly in the periphery, that is very important for conditions of pain and inflammation. Now, I can't believe we've gotten to this point in the conference without a gratuitous picture of the subject at hand, <laughs> um, but there it is. Now, I could go and spend my whole half hour with sexual innuendo about this plant, but um, I really shouldn't. We'll save that for my forthcoming book, Fifty Shades of Bud. <laughs> anyway, I got that out. Um, moving ahead. This is the biosynthesis of uh, cannabinoids in the plant. And as many of you know, they're present as acids. Uh, so these need to be decarboxylated uh, to produce THC to have it really be psychoactive. So these are called the pentyl uh, cannabinoids, and that's because they have whoops, a five-carbon chain on the end. Okay? Now, the plant has this interesting capacity um, that it'll work on other substrates. So if there are only three carbon chains, um, 
through what Professor Mishulam calls uh, nature's law of stinginess, it still works on those. And so there are a variety of other cannabinoids, most of which haven't come to public attention yet, but all of which have weird and wonderful pharmacological properties. Um, but I call this um, something else, enzymatic substrate promiscuity. So cannabis has ESP. <laughs> All right. So I've got my placeholder here, excuse me. Um, I wanted to have this picture to show the production of cannabinoids in different parts of the plant. And it really is true that the, the medicinal portion that is most important is the unfertilized female flower. Uh, and that has 18 times what are present in the leaves. There are many people who juice leaves um, and gain medical benefit. I'm not saying that they don't. It's just that if this derives from uh, cannabinoids, whether raw or uh, decarboxylated, it's a very small amount that they get. And I'd like to demonstrate that with the next slide. All right, got it. Uh, this is the true production facility for cannabinoids in the plant, the glandular trichomes. The one on the left is a cavitate uh, trichome, and uh, it actually produces that to keep it away from the plant itself because this is actually toxic to the plant tissue, the THCA. But you'll see that that's about 100 microns in diameter, as opposed to the trichomes on the leaves, what are called sessile uh, trichomes, that are only 20 microns. But if you use the formula there for the volume of a sphere, you see that there's about 100 times more volume in the bigger trichome than the little trichome. Additionally, the biochemistry is different. Um, in the leaves, there are a lot of bitter sesquiterpenoids that are there to prevent grazing by deer or other animals that would try to eat the plant. Um, so there are occasional people that get sick from juicing leaves of cannabis, and it seems to require a big amount. We really don't know what's going on there exactly yet. Um, I wanted to talk about some misconceptions about cannabidiol. This is really a new molecule to a lot of people, whereas some of us have been trying to talk about this for 20 years, mainly to deaf ears. But it was actually, its structure was elucidated by Professor Mishulam in 1963, a year earlier than THC, but it's gotten lost in the shuffle because it doesn't have the sexiness of being psychoactive the way THC is. But there's this misconception out there. A lot of dispensaries will advertise, we've got 0.1% CBD. This really isn't enough. A tiny amount is not enough. It might influence things subtly. Uh, Celia Morgan has done a series of papers about cannabidiol and the role it can play in diminishing difficulties attendant with THC. But in general, to get a real medicinal effect, there has to be a good titer of it on the best ratios are probably one to one, which is akin to what was in the plant in Afghanistan or Morocco in the olden days before selective breeding changed it to be all about THC. There is a persistent myth that cannabidiol is sedating. It is not. Um, it's been clearly shown with EEGs and everything else uh, that it's a stimulating molecule at low and moderate doses at very high doses, particularly in association with polypharmacy, such as in kids who are on a whole smorgasbord of uh, pharmacological agents, there can be drug-drug interactions that produce sedation. But in general, it's not a sedative. It is true that a lot of strains of uh, cannabis that have cannabidiol in them will be sedating, but it's not because of the cannabidiol. It is because those plants tend to be myrcene dominant, myrcene being a terpenoid with sedating narcotic type properties. It's, with THC, it is responsible for couch lock. There also is a prevalent myth that CBD turns into THC in the body. This is a misapplication of old research that seemed to, it was thought in the olden days that the biosynthetic pathway to THC went through CBD. That is not true. 
Additionally, I can tell you that when pure CBD has been tested and pharmacokinetics are done to look at what's in the blood afterwards, no THC is produced. Uh, so what CBD does do is increase the amount of anandamide, the endogenous cannabinoid in the body with regular usage. I also wanted to talk about THCA. Uh, so this would be in raw cannabis, as we pointed out. Um, it is there not to get people high once you heat it and decarboxylate it. It's there because it's insecticidal. Um, additionally, it's been shown to be a very strong anti-inflammatory without being altered uh, to THC. And it also affects a thing called uh, tumor necrosis factor alpha that's important in a number of diseases. Um, uh, now, I know there have been a lot of families that have talked to me about how they've added THCA to their child's regimen to treat seizures. And I have no doubt that what they're saying is true, but we have to analyze a little bit why that is. Uh, way back in 1978, the anticonvulsant properties of THCA THCA were tested, um, and it was found that it required a very high dose, 200 to 400 milligrams per kilogram per day, whereas CBD only requires 100. So if somebody were using leaves to get the THCA, um, we use the figure, figures from Martin Lee's article about this using Omrita, you'd need about uh, 2,200 leaves a day to get an anticonvulsant dose. So something else is going on, and if THCA is really needed, it's best come from the flower and not from the leaves, which make good compost or, or could be used otherwise. Uh, moving on to CBDA, so this is cannabidiolic acid, the precursor in the plant to CBD. This is what's present in fresh hemp. This is a natural herbicide, and it was noted hundreds of years ago when hemp was being redded in ponds that it killed the fish. Um, it's also been shown that this is a very powerful antiemetic drug, very powerful, much more than CBD or THC, so it prevents vomiting. And the, this is through a stimulation of the serotonin 1A receptor, which actually is the mechanism for a lot of other possible uses that haven't been tested yet including effects on anxiety, um, possible use in hepatic encephalopathy or other diseases. We also know that it has a strong effect on tumors, but this really is not new. This use was described by the Renaissance herbalists um, quite extensively, and it's only now uh, that we have the chance to look at this in the lab. Now I'd like to turn to the species con Oops, what did we skip? Ah, well, there are these other things in the plant uh, called terpenoids, and some of us have uh, been trying to convince people for a long time that these are important, and I will have uh, more demonstrations later. Uh, a lot of these are analgesic and anti-inflammatory in their own right, and a lot of them also have psychoactive properties. The thing that's thrown people off is they're present in very tiny concentrations in cannabis, but in this instance, they're extremely potent. And in, in combination with the cannabinoids, they really do uh, make a big difference in the, the medicinal properties. Now, the species controversy. Um, you'll hear a lot about sativas and indicas, most of which is nonsense. Um, because even the taxonomists uh, can't agree on it. That's what taxonomists do. These are the, the people that say what species is what in botany, and they are constantly changing their minds. There's no uniformity of opinion at all. They're worse than neurologists. <laughs> um, but um, the, the most standard approach to cannabis species issues is that it's one species with a lot of variation. This has been championed by Ernest Small in Canada. Um, he has a system that's still uh, acknowledged by most people. Type 1 is a high THC plant. Type 2 is mixed THC and CBD, the way cannabis frequently was in the past. And type 3 is the CBD predominant. This is what a lot of people are looking for. Um, but it, it didn't start there. 
Um, the plant was named Cannabis Sativa by Leonhard Fuchs uh, 250 years before Linnaeus came up with uh, binomial nomenclature. Um, but shortly after um, Linnaeus uh, named it Cannabis Sativa, along comes this upstart Lamarck in France who described this plant from India that he called Cannabis Indica. But if you look at it carefully, the one on the right, it has thin leaves. Um, and that's not what people are usually talking about today when they uh, talk about cannabis. And then you've got other pretenders to the throne. Uh, cannabis rustica, which is a plant about a meter high and without a lot of branches. Or cannabis afghanica, which is the name that some people apply to this next plant. Here we have a depiction of one of my mentors, Richard Evans Schultes, uh, in Afghanistan. Don't try this today. Um, you see him with his trusty guide. Um, but um, he described what he thought were three species. Now, I have the utmost respect for this man who, who really put me on a path uh, in medicinal plant research, but he was not a taxonomist. And what he's called cannabis indica is a broadleaf squat plant that is not the same at all as what Lamarck was describing. And we've got some demonstrations. This is um, a picture of David Watson with a plant he bred. This is a seed variety of Chinese heritage. Uh, this plant can get six meters high in one growing season with huge seeds. And it looks like a sativa, most people would say. But if you look more closely, it's got broad leaves that look like an indica. Um, and then a uh, picture I took in Morocco You've got plants that look like rustica, meter high, not much branching, but it, you know they're probably the same genetics as some of the others. So uh, you can't tell what's in the plant from its shape at all. Um, some years ago, Carl Hillig did a series of articles that looked at the chemical content. What he found was, and this is prior to uh, all the real interest in uh, cannabidiol predominant strains. But he found at that time that everything had some amount of THC, either relatively high or very high. What really showed the difference between one chemical variety, chemovar, and another was its terpenoid content. Um, that was true then. This has been subsequently demonstrated by Jeff Raber in his survey of uh, plants in California. Um, so Carl put together the idea that there was a chemical difference between uh, sativa and indica, uh, but they both originated in Central Asia and went from there. And you had a situation where he felt that all hemp was sativa and all drug strains of cannabis were indica. This, he also had a nomenclature based on the description of the plant, narrow leaf drug, broad leaf drug, narrow leaf hemp. And you'll see that we have broad leaf drug in the area of uh, Northwest India and Afghanistan, narrow leaf drug, what uh, Lamarck was describing uh, from India itself. And then you've got both hybridized in Western US and you've got narrow leaf hemp growing wild in Indiana and other places uh, before it was outlawed. So what would an ideal classification of cannabis look like? You've got all these shapes and sizes. Uh, you might want to mention that, what it looked like. Um, what's its basic chemical type, type 1 for THC? Uh, is it broad leaf? Is the plant compact? Um, more importantly to the consumer medically is what's in it? What's its specific cannabinoid content? And what's a specific terpenoid content? And that's rarely included. How does it smell? How does it taste when it's vaporized? And how is it used? What have patients reported in terms of benefits on their conditions? The best system, oh, I'm sorry. The best system I've seen is this one. Uh, it's been devised by Matt Giese and Mark Lewis. Um, there's an introduction to this in the O'Shaughnessy's broadsheet that uh, Fred Gardner uh, has brought along. Um, but this is the first thing I've seen that really adequately 
gives the information a consumer would really need in helping to select a strain uh, to use for their condition. And so you can have a common name. We know how interchangeable these can be. It's uh, the flavor du jour, I'm afraid. Um, but a description of what the predominant terpene class, secondary terpene, and tertiary terpene. After the first three, it's very hard to, to tell much difference. Um, but if you could see up here, we have a description of the cannabinoid content, the terpenoid percentage, picture of the actual plant, what the proportions are. Very uh, nice here, what the notes are in terms of its scent and taste, the effects that people uh, get from it, uh, relaxation, comfort, and something I really like, uh, a quantitative figure on the uh, terpenoid content. Here we see a very high degree of limonene. This might be a chemovar that's very good for treating depression uh, because limonene has that benefit. It also is very high in beta caryophylline beta caryophylline is a CB2 agonist, a very powerful anti-inflammatory. It also is very low in myrcene, the couch lock compound. And so this would be a non-sedating strain that people could use if they have to work or study, quite possibly. So I think that this would be a boon um, to future consumers. Uh, then we have older preparations. In 1985, synthetic THC was approved as a medicine, uh, dronabinol or marinol is the trade name. Uh, this is problematic. I can tell you that I used this extensively when it was downscheduled in 1999 for the next four years in my practice. And even people who were accustomed to cannabis had trouble with this. It's very quirky. It tends to produce dysphoria rather than euphoria. It's often too much. It seems to cycle. People be fine, then they're suddenly too high. Um, it's very expensive, and it lacks all those accoutrements, the synergistic components of whole cannabis. But there are still problems with cannabis administration itself. Um, smoking is still the most frequent method of application. Uh, it does remain illegal uh, most places. Even where it's legal, you're not supposed to do it publicly. In most places, you can't smoke anything, uh, tobacco or uh, cannabis. Um, the problems with it are it's very wasteful of THC. Uh, even in the best of circumstances, somewhere between 10% and 60% of the THC is actually available to the body. Um, it, although cannabis smoking alone without tobacco has not been linked to the development of lung cancer, it does produce polyaromatic hydrocarbons, which are carcinogens, and the body has to process. There's a metabolic demand on the liver there that's unnecessary. And this I'm afraid, um, contrary to the wishes of many people, just cannot get through the FDA approval process. Um, now, as if that weren't enough. Uh, now, the middle part didn't come out, but um, this was from a uh, paper by Sullivan, Jeff Raver, and his group um, about pesticides and smoked cannabis. They did an experiment where they took cannabis put small amounts of pesticides on them and see what they got out. The bottom line was between 40 and 70 percent of the uh, toxic residues uh, were, were still present in cannabis smoke. Uh, so this survived the burning process. Um, and unfortunately, these are really prevalent. Um, and the next slide will uh, go into that in a little more detail. All right, stay. So um, I queried a bunch of labs, and uh, one prominent lab in California, between 15 and 35 percent of their samples had uh, pesticide residues. And then I compiled this list uh, from a variety of sources, including the American Herbal Pharmacopeia monograph um, and some other labs and databases. And the asterisk items, which I realize are very hard to read, but just to give you an example, these are all items which are um, 
uh, cholinesterase inhibiting drugs. These are drugs uh, that are pesticides, but if they're given to somebody with seizures, they make it much more likely that they will get seizures. Even somebody who didn't have a seizure tendency will get seizures if uh, they're exposed to these uh, in sufficient amounts. Plus, as much as we'd like to demarcate ourselves from insects, if it kills an insect, there's a good chance that it's not good for you. There are some exceptions, but I'd be really careful about that. Okay, now, in the last 10 to 20 years, there's been a move towards vaporization. I think that this is a big advantage, but it's not perfect either. Um, the one that's pictured is the volcano vaporizer. It's a very good machine. Um, this is what it looks like at uh, different temperatures. Uh, this is raw, then 175 degrees Celsius, 195 and 230, the highest setting. And at that point, it looks a little toasted. Um, unfortunately, there has not been a study to date with this or any other vaporizer that's shown a total absence of the polyaromatic hydrocarbons. And again, we can't say that they will cause cancer if somebody's not smoking tobacco. We can say that the FDA is never going to approve a device that produces any amount of these. Simple. I, I promise you that's the case. So, in California and other places now, we have these various uh, preparations of uh, cannabis. Um, these all are still illegal under federal law, of course. There are some serious problems with quality control in the industry. Um, the American Herbal Pharmacopeia and other organizations are trying to develop standards that I think would be a boon to consumers, whether recreational or medicinal. Uh, additionally, when you have confections, particularly ones like this, you can understand that the DEA would look askance at this kind of thing when they have catchy little titles and they look just like real candy. It's attractive to the wrong element, meaning children. Um, this is a study that Arno Hazekamp did with the International Association for Cannabinoid Medicines. Uh, I helped put this together. It's looking at consumer preferences in medicinal cannabis usage. If you look at the red arrow, it is the case that smoking still predominated as of a couple of years ago. Um, and maybe 54% uh, of medicinal users had tried a vaporizer, but only half of those were using it on a regular basis. So in terms of harm control, this is really suboptimal. And before the advent of concentrates and a lot of confections, particularly in Europe, few people um, were using uh, oral preparations. Particularly for chronic conditions, um, uh, oral administration can be a big advantage in having a longer half-life and not requiring frequent dosing throughout the day. But as we've said earlier, the uh, Quest for THC has been operative on whether consciously or unconsciously it's affected the cannabis genetics over the last several decades. Um, in the olden days, um, the hashish that was uh, sieved or uh, rubbed could get up to maybe 20 or 30 percent at most. Uh, with modern techniques, and a good uh, chemovar, it's possible to get the THC level up to about 60%. I would seriously question why people need any more than that, but <laughs> the quest for higher levels of THC continues. Nowadays, we have cannabis concentrates, or what's called dabs. Um, on the left, you have a table uh, from Romano and Hazekamp, uh, an article about what they analyzed from different preparations. Part of the problem is um, THC and the other cannabinoids, terpenoids, they're sticky stuff. They need polar solvents, so either a fat or alcohol to get uh, this stuff out. But many of those same solvents are flammable or explosive. Not a week goes by that there isn't somebody that blows himself up trying to do a butane extraction at home. I could tell you stories. Additionally, a lot of these solvents, naphtha and butene, can leave toxic residues, and it just mystifies me how pinko hippie vegans uh, that are so fastidious 
in their uh, habits otherwise would accept this kind of solvent in the material that they're inhaling. Um, so even if I resemble that mark, I have remark, I have to. Um, uh, even people who use dabs acknowledge in surveys that they uh, suffer uh, onset of tolerance and withdrawal even um, from using these preparations. So I don't think that these are ideal at all for medical users. And again, I'd ask the question, um, how high does a patient really need to be to get relief? Well, we know from additional studies that the answer is, it, it, there is a sweet spot in therapeutics that is achievable or desirable where symptoms are treated without intoxication. Uh, just a little more about wax. Uh, we have these things called vape pens now, which again are a misnomer in most instances. You see on the left uh, some wax in the tube. You've got the unheated heating element, and then when you press the button, within seconds it's red hot. I guarantee you this temperature is way above the vaporization point of THC of the terpenoids that's necessary. But it's worse than that, I'm afraid. Um, this is a study that was in the New England Journal of Medicine, no less. It was about e-cigarettes. So they were doing testing with nicotine, but this is just the same in most instances as what a vape pen with cannabis will have, particularly if the propellant happens to be um, the same, uh, which is glycerol and propylene glycol. Now, propylene glycol is perfectly safe if taken orally in small amounts. However, nobody uh, in the olden days thought that it should be heated and inhaled. And when it is, it produces formaldehyde. Formaldehyde, if you didn't know, is embalming fluid. And it also is a uh, group one carcinogen, OK? And it was estimated in this article that the risk of cancer was 15 times greater than cigarette smoking. So this is not appropriate for medicinal users of cannabis. How about the side effect profile of cannabis itself? Um, it does have side effects. Anytime somebody starts an argument by saying, well, cannabis has no side effects, they've lost. This is something you should never say because it's just not true. The truth is that it has some side effects, but they're largely avoidable. Now, if we look at a tabulation of this, this was put together uh, by Mark Ware and his colleagues some years ago. They sort of lumped everything together. You've got Sativex, you've got smoked cannabis, you've got Marinol, but the overwhelming impression is the problem is with intoxication. So you have at the top where the red arrow is neurologic and, and psychiatric side effects. This includes panic, hallucination, anxiety. Okay, When you have numbers in the 35 to 40% range of paranoia or anxiety, that's not a preparation that the FDA will approve either. But it doesn't have to be that way because these are tend to be all high THC preparations. Um, but again, looking at a list of the side effects of smoked <laughs> cannabis, um, at the top of the list is the central nervous system. We've mentioned these. If there's enough, there's decreased muscle tone, that's good if there's spasticity present. Um, it does affect short-term memory if you have too much. It can be sedating. Some people get cold because the set point in the hypothalamus goes down. Uh, additionally, particularly for people who aren't used to it or get too high a dose, particularly with a vape pen, there are a lot of people that take one inhalation on a vape pen and instantly lose consciousness due to something called orthostatic hypotension. Their heart rate slows down so much that there's no oxygen to the brain. And then, of course, the pulmonary sequelae. Uh, again, although cannabis does not cause cancer when smoked, it is inarguable that there are no pulmonary issues. It produces cough, phlegm, and bronchitic symptoms. Uh, if we look at another tabulation, this is, I'm just going to introduce this very quickly. This is studies of government-approved cannabis in the Canadian program and Dutch programs. Those are in the hot colors because these were primarily smoked. The cool colors are Nabiximol, Sativex, the oral mucosal, 
preparation uh, with equal amounts of THC, CBD, and some terpenoids. And you'll see that in every instance, it's a lot higher hot colors than cool colors, except for dizziness. But let's move on. But those figures were done some years ago. In the early stages of the Sativex development program, uh, it was done allowing very high doses and very rapid titrations. What was found was after a certain number of sprays per day, maybe 10 to 12, there wasn't a big improvement in efficacy, how well it worked for treating conditions, but there was a big increase in side effects. What we know now is that the best dose is the lowest dose that improves symptoms. And if you get to the point of overt psychoactivity, it's not necessarily going to be more effective. If we compare um, the early studies of Sativex in the blue bars, 663 patients with a bigger single study later with lower doses and slower titration, you see the dizziness, which was 32% is now down to about 14. So, you know, this is suddenly common to uncommon. Additionally, the other uh, side effects, such as fatigue, somnolence, sleepiness, nausea, dry mouth, they all almost disappear. So the bottom line is you've got a much better safety profile and efficacy improvement by using lower doses and moving slowly. So we will amend the prior uh, slide. Um, cannabis does have side effects, but they are better than any medicine that you'll see advertised on TV. <laughs> Now, the next issue, single elements, oh boy, there we go, okay. Uh, I call this to entourage or not to entourage. Are we using single molecules or, uh, or combinations, uh, whole plant extracts? Now, I'm a neurologist. I took the same pharmacology courses that other doctors take, but I'm really a plant guy um, or have developed into one, um, uh, it is the case that very often whole plant medicine is better than single components that can't reproduce uh, the effects. Um, a good demonstration of why you need more than one element sometimes is the following. This was a study that was done of Nabiximol, Sativex. This was in cancer pain, the first study that was done this way. What we're going to highlight is a 30% decrease in pain uh, from beginning to end. Now, this study was done with placebo and gray. Tetranabinex is a high THC extract, just THC and terpenoids, no cannabidiol. Sativex, on the other hand, is equal amounts of THC and CBD. You see that at this very high level of response to the pain of cancer, um, that there was no real difference between placebo and the high THC extract, whereas with the addition of cannabidiol, it was highly significant. So that made all the difference. Um, another demonstration. On the left, we have um, Marinol, synthetic THC, and um, the red means the area dosing where you, people get into trouble. And it's clear down at about 15 milligrams that people can get a toxic psychosis. This is where people essentially freak out in the vernacular. They're hallucinating, they're paranoid. Um, in a test that was necessary to use extreme doses of, of Sativex to make sure that there were no problems with heart rhythm associated with it, uh, huge doses were given, uh, 48 milligrams at a time, and in four instances out of 250 exposures, people had toxic psychosis. And you see the difference, 48 milligrams of THC versus 15. This indicates a markedly improved therapeutic index or safety margin with cannabidiol and, uh, I'm getting there, uh, and uh, THC together. So coming towards the end, if we can advance. Okay. Uh, 
dosing with THC or cannabis. Um, dosing depends on the patient's prior experience with cannabis, if any, and uh, their underlying endocannabinoid tone. And this is going to vary. We can have a small person that needs a lot. We can have a big person that is a lightweight with respect to their tolerance and needs a very low dose. The best advice to anyone doing this, patient or physician, is start low and go slow. In general, 2.5 milligrams is a threshold dose for most people. Five milligrams of THC is generally going to produce an effect, and it's probably adequate for a lot of people. Some will need 10 milligrams at a time, but that's going to be too much for some people who are sensitive or uh, uh, who um, or who have tolerance, uh, they might need more. But in general, totals where 15 to 20 milligrams or more of THC actually gets into the body in a day is going to increase side effect profile and risk the production of tolerance, uh, which is something that's best avoided. Remember, not all of the administration techniques are efficient in what they do, particularly smoking. The presence of CBD and terpenoids gives a, a much bigger safety margin with the THC, which I feel needs to be tamed in many instances. Um, and patients should never confuse efficacy with psychoactivity. They should be titrating to the point that their pain or other symptoms are controlled, and that's it. You shouldn't have to feel high to get relief. So the correct dose is the lowest one that improves symptoms. And finally, it's crucial to understand cannabis is just one plant that affects the endocannabinoid system, that innate regulatory homeostatic mechanism of human physiology. The endocannabinoid system is also affected by lifestyle factors and diet. Uh, this is some of what we'll be emphasizing uh, in the new company that I've joined uh, called Phytech. So there's more information on the website and again uh, in the O'Shaughnessy's broadsheet that Fred has provided. So at that point, I, haven't, I hope I haven't overstayed my welcome and I thank you for your attention.